tag si Tio Ben. Oh, okay. Um, this, uh, this complexity uh, makes that, well, the, the number of strategies that have been designed for computationally designing enzymes is very, very broad and very different. So there are um, different options, let's see, okay. Um, and the way, uh, of course, I don't have time to, to explain all the different approaches that have been developed, but I would like to just provide you some, some hints on some key um, approaches uh, that I like to uh, also differentiate them, uh, so divide them in whether they put more the focus on, on the chemical steps or more the focus on the conformational changes. Um, and in this first, uh, more focus on the conform on the chemical steps, we have, yeah, you know, this incidental protocol, very famous one uh, developed by Professor uh, Haug and Professor Baker, that in a way they combine, uh, they, they perform quantum mechanics to uh, compute the transition state or the transition states of, of uh, the reaction that one is interested. And then this theoretical enzyme, theozyme, is grafted into a protein scaffold. And this is done with Rosetta. Um, and then with Rosetta, uh, mutations in the active site are introduced to try to better stabilize this transition state. Um, although at the end of the process, some short MD simulations are usually performed, uh, it's true that uh, the overall design uh, is based on considering the, the protein kind of rigid. This is in a way compens or a little bit fixed in the strategies called uh, named multi-state designs, um, where instead, so it's more or less like the same, the same um, story that I was talking about the inside out, but here instead of uh, just taking the X-ray structure of the enzyme, well, an ensemble of structures are, uh, are usually uh, uh, used um, and but the the problem or the weak point is that these and some these conformations are all very similar so they all come from very short and these simulations that can be very quickly and very easily interconverted if um, if we just give you some um, well some examples of how we can account for conformational changes um, so one can run extensive MD simulation MD simulations for instance and then use the caver the caber approach to evaluate the tunnels um, and find which are the regions of these tunnels that are narrowest, and then introduce mutations in these bottleneck regions. In this way, while well, we can introduce mutations not only in the active site, but also in this, in subs in this uh, tunnel uh, region. Another trendy thing these days is the use of ancestral scaffolds. So ancestral enzymes usually display higher levels of flexibility and in some cases, we have seen that the use of an ancestral enzyme, uh, just by introducing a few mutations, you can uh, actually um, enhance the, the enzyme activity in several orders of magnitude. And actually, um, yeah, uh, so that this is a better starting point for then applying um, directed evolution or uh, other techniques to enhance the activity. But the idea is that, yeah, the flexibility of ancestral enzymes and also the promiscuity can be actually um, yeah, taken into account and, and, and used for, for designing better, um, better enzymes. And the story that I'd like to share with you um, is what we are trying to do in the lab, um, that it's uh, based on developing a strategy uh, for computational enzyme design that takes into account these conformational dynamics, so this, um, the ensemble of conformations that the enzyme can adopt, and try to use uh, this, the knowledge gained with these MD simulations and, and uh, predict not only mutations in the, in, the, in the active site, but also far away from the active site. And, and if we go a little bit more into the detail, um, so uh, one question is why we care about this stuff. And the, the answer to this, to this question is, um, well, basically because directed evolution has, has, tell, has shown us that in many, many campaigns, in many directed evolution campaigns, distal mutations are, are actually needed uh, to enhance the enzyme activity. Here, I put some examples of that. So these are different directed evolution studies. Um, so different rounds of evolution. The blue line indicates the, the, the uh, increase in activity and the orange line shows um, the mean distance between the mutations introduced with respect to the active site. So you see that these numbers are like, like 18, 20 Armstrongs far away um, as average. 
Uh, so this is actually showing how important um, it is to not only predict mutations in the active site, but also far away. And this regulation of the enzyme function by touching distal points um, is very similar to the, uh, to the process of allosteric regulation. So you know that in allosteric uh, enzymes, we, can, we have that the function of this enzyme is regulated by the binding of another partner or by the, the, the binding of an effector at the remote site. So in a way, this you know, changing the activity of the enzyme by remote uh, changes, it's the, the process is like very similar to the, the process of allosteric regulation. And this is something that we are uh, trying to uh, yeah, expand. And then why um, conformational dynamics? Well, I don't need to convince you of that, but uh, uh, so I, here I put an example of uh, an enzyme that we have worked quite, uh, quite a lot, monoamine oxidase. So this enzyme is a, it's a dimer, it has this FAD uh, cofactor in the active site, this channel where the substrate needs to, yeah, uh, to use to get into the active site. And then there is this region here, the beta, this beta harp in, uh, highlighted in, in orange or yellow. And the point is that we did MD simulations. And if we focus our attention here, we realized that this beta harping was um, very, very flexible and actually was undergoing this huge conformational change to adopt open conformations. I'm not going to show you this in here, but we, um, we did other studies and we realized that this open structure, open conformation of the beta harping has an impact in the catalytic activity of the enzyme. So at the end, all these different conformations are key for the enzyme function. And it's evident that if we wanna change the function, in a way, it's, it's very relevant to know this ensemble of conformations. Well, this idea of the enzyme seen not as a single conformation, but rather as an ensemble of conformation, is very, it's nicely represented by the free energy landscape concept. And here I put a model, uh, model landscape where, for instance, we have that conformation one is the one that is most stable, followed by conformation two. Um, the transition from this conformation one to the conformation two um, it's going to be faster or slower depending on how high this energy barrier is. Um, for instance, in the case of side chain rotations, usually these transitions are quite fast, picoseconds, but in some cases we need microseconds. Loop motions that play a very important role for the enzyme function um, could be fast again, but also quite uh, slow. And at the other extreme, we have allosteric transitions that usually take quite a um, long time to, to happen. Well, how we uh, use, so how we connect this free energy lands, landscape concept with computational enzyme design? Well, the way we see it, uh, so we see uh, enzyme design as a population shift problem. So our idea is that we reconstruct the conformational landscape of, uh, in this case, the wild type enzyme. Um, and imagine that uh, we wanna uh, stabilize this conformation too, that has a promiscuous activity that we'd like to enhance, or that um, it's better for binding the, the new substance that we are interested, in, et cetera. So the idea would be to um, characterize this free energy landscape and then try to predict mutations, not only on the active site, but also distal from the active site to try to stabilize this conformation to, uh, for instance, that we are interested. Um, okay, how we predict these distal points? This goes, um, to explain this, it's, we need to, uh, talk about again about the allosteric regulation. So, um, in a for the studying allosteric systems, some people uh, the strategy that they follow is that okay, they do the MD simulations and then they use graph theory to translate this um, the information obtained thanks to the MD simulation into uh, simplify well into a graph complex graph. Um, here we have that each one of these spheres it's a residue of the protein. And then you have the different lines connecting the, the pairs of, of residues. Uh, well, the line is weighted according to the correlation, uh, the correlation value. So if these two residues uh, along the MD move in a correlated fashion, the line will be uh, shorter um, if, uh, if the movement is highly correlated or longer if the, if the, if the movement is not or, or it's, it's weakly correlated. Okay, this, this uh, strategy, as I said, is, has been used for studying allosteric systems. And usually what people do at this point is then to try to find communities within this complex graph 
um, and to try to understand how the different regions of the enzyme or different domains are connected and how this is, is changing. Um, what we do instead, uh, instead of communities, we are more interested in positions in amino acids. And usually what we do, uh, we try to find which is the, the, the path that is shorter, so that it's more correlated. Um, and that is what we call the shortest path map. This SPM then can be plotted back into the 3D structure. And then you can check in 3D, you know, what is the connection between the active site and positions far away from the active site. So in principle, this tool could be used to detect conformationally relevant positions far away from the active site that might have an impact into the active site residues. And the point is that we apply this for the first time in the case of the retroaldolases. I was talking about the inside out protocol developed by Ken Hauk and David Baker. Well, the retroaldolase, the, the first computational designs were generated with this, um, with this approach, with this inside out approach. And then these retroaldolases that were not very efficient were evolved uh, with directed evolution. And, um, and this is the ADEF. So this retroaldolase is, is, the, is the most evolved um, retroaldol um, variant uh, generated uh, thanks to directed evolution. And I put here uh, with spheres um, the positions that were targeted in this directed evolution campaign. Well, we were happy to see that many of these positions uh, are also contained in the SPM. So many of the positions we find directly in the path, uh, but if not, they are making interactions with residues uh, uh, included in the path. And so at this point, we were very happy and, and we were wondering about uh, how, uh, yeah, about the potential of this tool um, and whether we could use it for designing new engines. And that's what I would like to show you in this talk. So um, I would like to share our new, um, uh, yeah, recent, some recent studies about uh, tryptophan synthase um, that we have uh, reconstructed these conformational landscapes and then use these uh, correlation-based tools to predict uh, and to generate uh, new, uh, new variants. <clears throat> okay, so if I give you a little bit more of info about this, this enzyme, so this is tryptophan synthase. Um, uh, it's an allosterically regulated enzyme that is composed by two subunits, the alpha uh, and the beta. Um, here you have the overall reaction. So in the alpha, this EGP is converted into GP3 and releases indole that goes through an inner channel to the uh, active site of the beta subunit. And then is, this indole is coupled to the alserine to finally generate um, L-tryptophan. The point is that the beta subunit in the absence of alpha is not efficient, and the alpha in the presence, in the absence of beta, sorry, it's not efficient either. Um, and in fact, having standalone versions, isolated versions of this beta active, uh, it's important for an industrial perspective for the synthesis of L-tryptophan, uh, L-tryptophan derivatives. Well, this, this regulation exerted by the alpha and beta has an effect on uh, a domain called the COM domain that, it, that covers the active site. So here you have the active site um, and this COM domain is on top of it. And uh, according to X-ray data can adopt open, partially closed and closed conformations. Um, and this is, this is going to be very important as I'll show you in a bit. Well, I said, no, having a standalone version of beta is, is interesting from an industrial perspective. And so the Arnold lab took uh, Pitococcus furiosus tryptophan synthase uh, and apply directed evolution to try to make the beta standalone. Here I'm showing the plot. So this is the, the K-cut in, in, in purple of the complex. Uh, if we remove the alpha, the K-cut drops, uh, and then they apply directed evolution and enhance the K-cut um, uh, ninefold. Um, and in the, in the case of the multiple variant, and this was mainly due to the, the, introduce, the introduction of um, these different mutations that are far away from the active site and that are not located in the COM domain either. So the first starting point and what we were interested in, in, in exploring was first, let's have a look at this system. Let's have a look at, at the conformational landscapes of, uh, of these different um, enzymes. So the first, what I'm showing here is the, the complex 
um, so the X axis, it's, uh, we generated a path of a structure. I told you, you know, that we have these X-ray structures having the COM domain in the open, partially closed and closed. So we generated a path of a structures uh, where the COM was yeah, actually changed from open states to the closed states. Um, and then we, uh, we have here the deviation. So the different conformation sample uh, along this, um, this, uh, this simulation, um, uh, it's, it's, it's telling you how deviated are these conformations with respect to the ideal path of uh, structures uh, generated. And then of course the color, it's uh, the, the relative stabilities of these different conformations. Well, in complex, what you can see in here is that the open and partially closed conformation of the com domain are very stable. And we have that the closed conformation, it's accessible, it's about four kilocalories, uh, it's there, okay? So, um, so one obvious thing by looking at this fell is that this enzyme, this, this enzyme in the presence of alpha has a quite broad conformation heterogeneity. What happens if we remove the alpha? If we remove the alpha, the enzyme, the beta alone, gets stuck at close conformation of the com domain. And also if you check here, so uh, that this highly deviated. So basically this close conformation, um, it's not very productive, um, for, first thing to, to say. And second, uh, well, we have lost this conformation of heterogeneity. So now there is no open or partially closed states available. If we put now the mutations that Arnold um, did in the lab with the directed evolution, what we have is that now we, recon well, we recover this um, conformation of heterogeneity. So now the COM domain is able to go to explore open, partially closed and closed conformations of the COM domain. And not only that, we also see that the closed conformation of the COM it's now much more stable, which is also in line with the higher activity of this variant with respect to the starting uh, heterocomplex. Okay, so this was nice because in this way we could um, analyze and understand better how these, these mutations were altering this conformational uh, landscape. The question is, can we predict these positions? Can we predict the positions that the Arnold lab uh, introduced? Um, well, so we, again, we applied the SPM uh, as shown here. Uh, in the case, so we did it in the, in the starting uh, enzyme. So the beta in complex. Um, and we identified several positions and we were happy to see that uh, two of them are included. Three of them are not included, but are really making interactions with residues included in the path. And only one has no interactions and uh, we don't know exactly the role of, the, of, of this one. But we were happy. So it looks like in this case, again, uh, some of the positions targeted um, along this directed evolution campaign was all, were, also, were also found. Um, um, and so this uh, encouraged us to go one step further and try to, um, try to design tryptophan B, standalone tryptophan B variants uh, by using this uh, SPM approach. However, we have some challenges here. So this protein has about 400 residues. If we apply the SPM, um, well, we reduce this number to, to 70 or 60 something positions. Still 60 something is a very big number. So the number of possibilities is, is, is super big. Uh, so we need to further reduce down this number. And the other problem that we have is that, okay, so we identify conformationally relevant positions, but which amino acid should be included at each one of those positions? We don't know. So we need, um, some way to, to predict this. Well, we got inspired by this paper published in PNAS by the Sterner Lab from Regensburg University. Um, and and what, uh, what they did is that, uh, while well, they reconstructed, so I was talking oh, at the beginning about this ancestral enzyme. So they, they reconstructed this ancestral enzyme, the last bacterial common ancestral tryptophan synthase. And what is interesting is that the beta subunit um, is, does not require alpha to operate efficiently. Actually, in the presence of alpha, works worse. So, tryptophan, so we have that in this ancestral enzyme, there is an allosteric inhibition. And uh, we have like the beta, that the beta has a standalone activity. 
And this standalone activity was lost along evolution. So these are the different ancestral enzymes that the external lab reconstructed thanks to this uh, tree. Um, and this, uh, well, this um, standalone was lost, as I was saying. And actually, this ANC3 is the first ancestral enzyme that has dependency on, on alpha to operate efficiently. So ANC3 is the first one that has that it's uh, allosterically activated by alpha. Well, we decided again to have a look at these enzymes and to reconstruct the free energy landscapes. And I'm showing here um, the results. So and this, this is what I already discussed. So this is for Pitocopus furiosus um, in complex. And this is LBCA, the ancestral in complex. What you can what we can see here in this in this landscape is that the beta with alpha in this case gets also stuck. At this point, gets stuck at partially closed conformations. But um, in a way, so uh, the presence of alpha is uh, reducing this conformational heterogeneity and also is destabilizing the closed conformation of the condomain. If we remove the alpha and reconstruct the felt, what we have is that, well, remember that, no, that uh, this has a standalone activity, so there is an increase in activity. What we have is that, um, well, in the absence of alpha, this enzyme has the ability to adopt close conformations of the condomain and actually are quite very stable. And although in this case, we don't have open and partially closed conformations of the comb, we also we think what is important in here is that this ancestral enzyme has conformational. So the way it has conformational heterogeneity is through this very wide minima at this um, this uh, yeah at this region. So the enzyme has the productive closure of the com domain, um, but also has the ability to adopt these deviated close uh, conformations of the com that are important. We think are important for binding and for releasing the product. Okay, um, the question is okay. Can we now use the SPM and try to generate a new standalone tryptophan B? So we focus our attention into this ANC3, uh, so this ancestral enzyme that is the first one that has, as I said before, uh, dependency on alpha. And the process we follow was, um, was this one. So we have the standalone ensemble of LBCA uh, tryptophan B. We apply the SPM, uh, we generated the SPM. Um, and so by doing so, we uh, identify the conformationally relevant positions. Um, as I said before, so we reduce the well, reduce, so we reduce yeah the sequence of space to from twenty to the four hundred to twenty to the seventy, which is still it's it's a super big number. Um, so we had to reduce this this number further, and the way we do it, we did it was to compare the sequence at each one of these conformationally relevant positions. So we check which is the residue that has LBCA and which is the residue that has ANC three that we want to improve. Um, and by doing this sequence comparison at these conformationally relevant positions, we reduce the sequence space to only six positions. And not only that, apart from reducing the, the number of possibility, possibilities to only six, we also got the specific, uh, so the nature of the amino acid that should be introduced at each one of those. Um, and this is what we name the conformationally based design variant well, um, SPM6 also, we, as we call it. Um, and this variant has mutations. If you check where they are, they are far away from the active site except one, and none of them is in the com domain. So we asked the external lab to try this, this variant. Um, and, uh, and what we observe is that, well, those, this SPM6 uh, has enhanced uh, standalone activity, seven-fold increase in, in, in KCAT. Um, although we did not reach LBCA numbers, uh, we were able to successfully improve the standalone uh, activity of this ANC3. And this was done by just testing one design. So this was very, very cool. And if we do some numbering here, so well directed evolution in the Arnold evolution um, experiment, they had to generate and screen more than 3000 variants. Uh, and this, uh, and finally they, they provide a nine fold increase in KCAT. So we were happy with, with, this, uh, uh, with these results. One thing that we were not expecting, um, so we, we, we thought that by introducing these mutations and generating this SPM6, 
um, by enhancing the standalone activity in a way we would reduce uh, or we would like make that this SPM6 is no longer uh, regulated by, by the alpha. But actually what we found is that the SPM6 in complex is even better than the uh, starting ANC3 in complex. Um, this is what I'm showing here. So uh, 3B, well, ANC3 alone and in complex, our SPM6 alone that has this enhancement in, a, in a standalone activity, but in complex is better and actually is even better than LBCA. Um, well, to, to ex well, to explain this a little bit more, uh, we reconstructed the conformational landscape. This is what I show you already. This is SPM6 as a standalone. So we think we have enhanced the standalone activity because we have shifted the minimal uh, towards more closed values. Uh, the black line here is showing where the minima of the LBCA uh, lies. Um, so we think, yeah, uh, this improvement is mostly due to this um, shift population shift towards more closed states of the conformation of the condomain um, state um, of the condomain. And we think the SPM6 in complex is even better because we think it's mainly due to the fact that now this one is, has, has a higher conformational heterogeneity. So it, instead of having these broad minima, it has actually two minima. And these minima uh, provide the enzyme the ability to adopt uh, well, these different conformations that are also needed for, for the release and also for, for the binding. Well, that's the story about tryptophan B that I wanted to share with you. Um, and now uh, we are focusing on also on trying to develop um, a standalone version of the alpha subunit. While the alpha subunit has less interest from an industrial perspective, but still, I think uh, in our well, I think it's interesting to try to apply the methodology and and and, and try to make the alpha also stand alone. Um, well, this alpha um, again, as in the case of the beta, without beta, it's not very efficient. Um, and let's see if I can see this thing moving. Okay. Um, so this is the, the, the alpha subunit. This alpha subunit, the regulation that is exerted by the beta is mostly on this loop six and loop two. So these uh, two loops uh, are the ones that change uh, conformation. Uh, and here you have the active side with the substrate IGP bound and the catalytic residue shown. So mostly um, the activity and the loss theory of this enzyme is regulated by this, uh, this loop two and loop six conformation. Well, um, the Sterner lab um, actually realized that there is this, uh, this uh, BX1 enzyme from ZMIs that has activity standalone. Uh, here I'm showing the kinetic data, um, the KCAT and the KM for, uh, for IGP. And if you check here, so I have overlaid the ZMIs BX1 with LBCA tryptophan A and with ZMIs tryptophan A. And what you can see here is that they are perfectly aligned. Uh, there are some differences, but um, they are um, overall very similar, uh, although the sequence identity is not that high. Um, and actually, the, the external lab took the ZMI tryptophan A and added the loop 6 of BX1. And, real, and they realized that by doing so, the K-cut of the enzyme was substantially enhanced. However, the KM was very, very bad. Okay? Um, so we decided to, um, yeah, to work on this and try to apply our methodology in, company, in collaboration with them um, to try to make um, um, yeah, the, the alphas uh, standalones without the need of transferring the whole loop and, in, and ideally having variants with good KCAD and good KM. We are still working on this. <laughs> um, uh, but here I'm, uh, I'm showing you these are um, these uh, conformational landscapes. Now the axes are different, so well similar but different. So the x-axis uh, is related to the to the opening and closing let's see, of the active site, and the y-axis is related to the opening of this loop six mostly. 
Well, if we plot here the different enzymes, so this is the, our reference enzyme that has a standalone activity, zmis bx one This is the LBCA, this is ZMIs, and this ZMIs with a loop transfer. Um, and what we think is important is, uh, well, to have the ability to close the, conform to close the active site um, uh, of the enzyme, but also the ability of the enzyme to adopt uh, close or an open conformations of this loop uh, loop six, and uh, we think that um, by transferring this loop six, this is in a way um, improved because yeah, the enzyme now it's uh, although it's still a little bit hard, but it's it's able to have a little bit more of flexibility, a little bit more the ability to to close this um, to to get this close conformation of the active site, and this is something that is. Uh, no, not possible with ZMIs. Uh, in the case of LBCA, well, it's it's possible, but it's very hard. So he, there's a lot of red, so it's very hard to escape from this from this minimum. We also did um, simulations in the presence of IGP of the sub with the substrate, um, and realized that well, these are the results for for ZMIs, same same level labels, so same open close uh, conformations and close uh, open conformations of loop six. Um, and we think the bad KM, especially the bad KM here, when we have transferred loop six is because this, uh, well, you see that you have, you have these additional minima at uh, open conformations of the loop six, um, which yeah, is bad for, 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 the, for the binding for the KM. Well, um, Similarly, as before, we apply the SPMs. Uh, in this case, we applied it in VX1 and LBCA. And we could, by doing sequence uh, comparisons, we could identify conformationally relevant positions and also the nature, as we have a good reference, the nature of the, um, the amino acid that should be introduced at each one of those positions. Here you have where these uh, mutations are. And you can see some are close in the active site, some others are farther, farther away. Um, yeah, we reconstructed the FELs. The FELs look promising. And so, although here it's true that, yeah, mm, still we have, we have these additional minimums, uh, but we asked them to, to, to try them. And we were happy to see that uh, this SPM, this, I'm showing here the KCAT. So this SPM uh, one has, uh, we, we enhanced the KCAT uh, yeah, almost sevenfold. And also in this case, as, oppo as opposed to tryptophan B, um, SPM1 without, uh, I mean, SPM1 with beta uh, is not very efficient. Okay, so in this case, yeah, the, the mutations that we introduced somehow disrupt the communication between, between subunits. So this is a project that we are still working on it. So we have now more variant, more, um, more variants uh, well, computationally designed and, and that we ask uh, the Sterner lab to to try them, um, and we are still waiting for the results, but uh, hopefully we will be able to come up with a variant that has both good KCAD and good uh, KM, and without the need of transferring the whole thing um, into the whole loop into the enzyme. Okay, so yeah, um, that's that's everything that I wanted to, to share with you uh, today. So I would like to now thank everyone in the group so this was, uh, was well, Miguel Angel uh, was working on tryptophan synthase uh, for, yeah, for, for many years, also Javi for, uh, yeah, it was great to have him um, all these years and work uh, with him on, on tryptophan synthase. Um, Christina is now taking the lead. So she's now working on the alpha, but also on the beta bit. Uh, Frida, that was a, a visitor with this HPC uh, year of uh, fellowship. So she came and, she was also working on, on, on developing new uh, SPM6, let's say. Um, Guillermo and Miquel, also for their help um, in the Tryptophan B uh, project. Of course, uh, Reinhard and Thomas for the very nice collaboration. Um, yeah, I enjoy it very much, uh, the discussions with them. And yeah, I think we, we do a, a great team. Um, well, these institutions for the funding, yeah, thanks again for the invitation and thank you so much for the attention. I'll be happy to answer the questions. Thanks, thanks, Sylvia. Um, I don't see so, you. Uh, yeah, I turn on my camera and can you hear me, Liz? Yes, yeah. 
Uh, thanks, thanks, Silvia, for, for this super nice talk and, and really well explained. Uh, so let's open some time for questions. Let me also go, uh, open the chat just in case someone types things. So I, I have a question, may I start? Maybe? Sure, go ahead, Martin. Okay, thank you. So uh, a very nice talk, Silvia, very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. Avenues you are exploring. Actually, this is uh, quite the, the most difficult question probably in, when you're considering mutations because you actually don't know what, the, what is happening here. But yeah. you're rationalizing with very cool simulations. And this is uh, hopefully the way uh, that we can try to predict all these uh, digital mutations. So I, I had a, a specific question when you were trying to uh, redesign, you know, mm -hmm. you added six mutations. All of these mutations were around the path. Yes, yeah. uh, the shortest path methodology you were using. So I was wondering what happens with the negative control? What happens with the other mutations that are not along the path? Have you tried them? Uh, is is this uh, something like, that okay that, you mean like we, randomly or take no 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 i mean i mean you identified some mutation that were on the path as well. right but but probably there are other differences between the those ancestral proteins so as a negative control you say well if i include those mutations in my protein then i can show that it doesn't have this allosteric effect and therefore uh, only things along the path are relevant or not i i, see, I mean as a as a negative control that would support the hypothesis uh, yeah, um, well, what we have done, um, and what I think it's, it's a very interesting is, okay, so we, we found these six positions, no, that we think are important. Um, and what we did was to do a sequence alignment of many tryptophan synthase, and we checked whether there was a natural tryptophan synthase having, you know, the same, this six position these six positions mutated to the same amino acid that we have in SPM6. And we found one uh, tryptophan synthase from a, from an organism from a lake in Norway, well anyway, uh, um, isolated uh, system. And and we uh, so we found there was only one, well, only this one. And we asked them the sternal lab to, to try to see whether also in this case we also have a standalone uh, activity. And actually, yeah. So this, this variant, this enzyme has a standalone activity. So this was very nice because this is showing that while the positions that we have identified, um, I mean, made, a, made something and, and, and the context, let's say, uh, so of course the sequence identity of this uh, tryptophan synthase is, I don't remember now the number, but it's not very, uh, it's not very similar, let's say, it's not, not very high. Um, um, it's, it's, it's showing no, that the, the positions that we are uh, identifying are important and are really contributing to this uh, standalone activity. Um, I don't know, did I, did I, did it, are you happy with this answer? Or? <laughs> well, uh, it, it's, it was just a, a curiosity because, uh, of course... I mean, with was... negative control, what would you... I mean, I would try all the other mutations, maybe. Uh, and the other yeah, I think what Martin is implying... The path. Yeah. But the point is that the other positions are exactly the same. So you have the same amino acid at the other just, positions. But the, just six positions are different and they are all along the path? Exactly. Oh, wow. Okay. No, in, in, in your mutant, I think, I think Martin is saying when you compare with, uh, with ancestral. Yeah, so we are doing the, the sequence compare. So, like, uh, so we compute the SPM. We identify the conformationally relevant ones that are these 68. Yes. Okay. And then the 68, for the, uh, the 68, we compare the sequence between LBCA and ANC3. And by doing this, we reduce it to six. So the other ones are all the same. Uh, I think in Martin, the, in the maybe... path, but outside the path, are they different? Ah, the outside the path, of course. So we didn't focus on outside the path. Yeah, sure. But as a, that's my negative control question that, that was about it. Is, is as, a, as a control, you should include them maybe and try that they don't have any effect. So everything yeah. is on the path is affecting. That, that was my question, actually. But, but, but yeah, probably you, you, not when comparing to ancestral, but when comparing with the, far, uh, um, with the directed evolution one, that we know that those, in, those mutations uh, have a positive effect in catalysis in principle. Maybe, you, maybe to, to check your hypothesis, Martin, you could, and, and, in, and in those directed evolutions, you have positions that are in the path and positions that are not in the path. 
Here you could do combinations, like let's try the ones that are in the path, let's try all of them together, and now let's delete the ones in the path and keep the ones that are outside the path. Mm -hmm. to see, yeah. to see how, how these are, how this dynamics uh, communication might be important. Yeah. Another, another thing that we did, uh, well, that we are doing actually, is that, uh, so related to this, uh, the, the PNAS paper by Sterner, um, so um, they align, so they, they align the sequences and, and actually by doing some comparisons of, okay, so these are the ones that have allosteric activation. These are the ones that have allosteric inhibition. No? So comparing and seeing the differences between systems, they, uh, with doing just simple no, uh, sequence uh, comparison, they could, uh, they could identify some important positions that's in this PNAS paper. And what is interesting is that these positions are different from the ones that we get. Um, and there's only one that is common. Um, and so these are, so we are now, we also try to, so our approach is to say, okay, let's take the six that we identify plus the other one, the four that they identify and try to make a better, and combine them and try to make a better, um, a better enzyme, but actually it's it not. So it's it's not better. It's not uh, it's not working. So we are now also doing these con these uh, these controls. Are um, those four mutants on the path? Only one only in one. the path. Okay. Okay. That, well, that's that's actually. Well, only one. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because it's. A, um, so we were just focusing on the SPM of the LBCA. You no. Know? Um, another option would be to generate the for the allosterically activated and the allosterically uh, inhibited. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, we just focus on the ancestral enzyme. I'm sure that if we check this careful uh, and, and see you know, these modern enzymes, the SPMs, maybe by doing a combination of the SPMs, we could detect uh, uh, some of those. But that, that's something I, I'm just guessing. So we have not uh, done it yet. For sure, there are many things to do yet. And <laughs> And things. I mean, it's amazing that you are getting close to to something here. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. More questions? Someone else? Uh, yes. Uh, hey. Um, very nice talk, uh, Sylvia. I'm Sergi, a PhD Thanks. also from Victor's Club. Uh, so I wanted to ask if. Uh, this type of analysis of enzymes uh, with the dynamical dynamical networks, uh, do you think they will be able to replace uh, experimental directed evolution? Like you would be able to do in the end in silico with this and just try uh, the best one that you get with your analysis and then you, you don't have to do any more in directed evolution rounds and libraries and ra completely random uh, mutagenesis. Mm. Well, that's our hope, right? So that's what we why we are working. I mean, yeah, I hope, yeah. So that would be really great. And and I mean, I'm I'm excited. I think you know we have achieved um, a lot. Um, in I mean, with all the advances and all. I mean, it's very hard, no? As I said, the enzyme catalysis is very complex, and 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 there are many things that need to be into. I need to. Be, to take into account to, to make an efficient enzyme. But I think um, we are in the right path. So uh, yeah, I hope in the, in the near future, we, we will be able to you know, make very good predictions and that yeah, just by testing only one enzyme or two enzymes, why not? Uh, getting a, a very efficient <laughs> enzyme and you know, without the need of this directed evolution. But, yeah, so far we are far away, but yeah, I think. Cool. And and did you think about maybe using some machine learning or predictive tools uh, with your current uh, like methodology to maybe accelerate creating efficient evolved enzymes, but without maybe trying to I mean without avoiding the long calculations and simulations that we have to. Yeah, do totally. As yeah, I mean that's that's the drawback. So no, well we have many many challenges still. No, so one is okay. In this case, uh, it's nice, but but we had a reference, right? Exactly. So we 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 got. I mean, we had the reference, and that's why we just you know just comparing the sequence. Okay, we got the the 
the amino acid that has to be put at each one of these positions. Um, so this is something that we need to work on. Um, and this is where I think, for instance, we could probably apply machine learning and try to yeah, generate or see, um, I don't know, these language models or this kind of stuff to try to predict what is the, what could be an, an option at each one of, of these positions. And then the other is the limitation of, yeah, computational power. So reconstructing this free, free energy landscape is super, super expensive, as you know. Um, so mm -hmm. if we were able, and we, we could be, I mean, if we, if we had a strategy to somehow evaluate this conformational heterogeneity without the need of such extensive MD and such, uh, yeah, you know, uh, that would be also very, very interesting and very, yeah, uh, yeah, it would make computational design design much better, no? Because in a way, okay. when you talk to them, uh, sometimes they are, they, <laughs> They can do it. They can do the experiments even faster than us. Uh, no, to reconstruct these belts is super, super expensive. It's true that once you have them, then you have all this understanding, and you can apply this understanding to, to, to design variants in a faster way. But, uh, but we are limited. And, okay. Yeah. 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 Totally. Well, th thanks for for the talk and answering my questions. Thank you, Sergey. So, so, so that's it. You just state my, my the two questions I had which we can talk later <laughs> now now we have this thing you now that the, the fact that how do we apply this in a pure perspective manner like when we don't have a reference mm -hmm. and uh, and also how expensive it is to run one of these one of these uh, how, how first of all how you know for sure they are converged like if you run 10 times more how different they are yeah and and and, and currently the ones that you're running uh, how many days of GPU calculation takes, Mark, for example, uh, for, for a 400 amino acid residue? Yeah, well, it, it I mean, it depends also on the strategy. So in the case of the alpha, we are doing um, classical MD, you know, unbiased MD. So, mm -hmm. and we do like, uh, yeah, five replicas of 1,000 1, nanoseconds at least. Um, and in this way, yeah, for alpha works, I think it works nicely and, and usually to construct the SPM. So we take into account all these ensemble of simulations. Uh, and if you do it, they look pretty much, I mean, conserved. So it's, well, it's, of course, the more you simulate, some changes would, would, uh, to the SPM could happen. But uh, I think, yeah, if you have, pretty long MD uh, and multiple replicas, what you get is more or less uh, consistent. So, um, and we are happy with that. In the case of treatment uh, B, uh, yeah, so for the COM domain, we, we did uh, metadynamic simulation. So we forced the COM domain to, to go from the open to the, to the, to the close. Um, and, and this is kind of good because in this way, so we are forcing the transition that we want and when you construct the SPM, so well, you are like, you know, identifying the, the positions that are important. Uh, in this, and in, in that particular case, I think, yeah, the SPM are more um, robust or more conserved. So you can rely on, on those better. What, what, what's... And the time, the time. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, if you said one, one, five microseconds, so we yeah, know more or less what takes. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so several days. Yeah. <laughs> See. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Alpha is smaller though, but yeah. Okay. Well, I, we'll talk. We'll talk in five minutes in the other chat, and and because I think we'll talk. You could probably apply some networks theory here to not type, not have to repeat all the simulations for every variant. And you can just get some elastic network response to the network that you build, and, mm -hmm. and then at least at least screen hundreds or thousands of them very quickly, and then sure, do three or four with larger computation. Yeah, yeah. And we, we we can we can look at that. A any other question from from audience for general audience? So it's now two minutes to one. So um, yes, I have a short question. Sure. So thank you, Sylvia, for the presentation. It was very very interesting. And maybe it's some information that, that I missed during the presentation, but uh, uh, when building the shortest path, mm -hmm. 
which two regions of the protein are you trying to connect with that path? Because what, mm. does, th does this make sense? Um, yeah, um, so the point is that the, the SPMs that I show you are for the first project, um, we have the alpha present. So we took the simulation where we have alpha and beta. However, uh, we just focus on the alpha. Because uh, of course you can you could apply the SPM and, and take into account the whole thing. But the problem is that then you see more the communication between subunits. And in this particular case, we were not interested in exploring the communication between subunits, but rather you know the, the conformational dynamics of the beta that we want to make um, a standalone. Uh, so that's how we did that. Um, so although we have alpha in there. Uh, we just compute because for running the SPM, you need uh, two matrices, the distance matrix and the correlation matrix. And this was computed, taking into account only the beta. Okay, okay, thank you. I was mute. Any last question, Aron? Okay, if not, uh, join me for a last clap to Sylvia. And um, Sylvia, I guess we can go into the other chat room. And anything from, from you, Alba, or from any host that wants to say? Nothing else from us. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It was great to see you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see so, you in a couple of minutes in the other chat. Uh, we, we, Victor, which is the link? Uh, uh, okay. I'll, uh, actually, I also need to send it to Martin. If I, I, I thought, I, yeah, I told him. Uh, yes, please. Eva, Eva so, send it. So let me just find it. Yeah, Eva, Eva okay. It, yeah, just to be I'll, sure that I don't. I'll, I'll forward it to all of you. Okay. Good. Okay. See you in a bit then. Thank